working with RE Technology today to bring you this exciting session. We've got some really good stuff for you today. Any of you, including myself, that's in the world of sales understands that without understanding the best way to convert leads to sales, none of us are going to maximize our business. So we've got some great experts that have done some really neat things here to tell you all about it. So let's flip to the first slide and we'll get rolling. So first, just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Marilyn Wilson, and I'm the co-founder of RE Technology and Wave Group, which is a consulting firm in the industry. And really what we love to do and why we get so excited about these kinds of sessions is we love to help people find great ways to change their business, change their model, change their attitude, change their focus, and be able to do really good things with their business. And here's some, some great people to help you do that today. Next slide. So first, we've got three artists with us today, as we call them the experts. We've got Beverly Herdman. Lance Simpson and Walt Baum. Um, Beverly is an amazing realtor from the area in Virginia. She's been doing this since 2005 and is the owner of Wine Trail Homes. And she's part of Keller Williams. Lance Simpson is also a, a full-time agent. He specializes in residential real estate. He's part of the NAR world. And he's got some really, really good life-changing life ideas for you here. And then we've got Walt Baum, who's been in the sales arena for a long time as well, for Onboard. And he's going to give you some really good thoughts, too, about the ways to manage your sales process more effectively to close more deals quickly. OK, next slide. Then we've got even two more. We've got people that are going to help us understand the science behind sales. Because as we all know, it's an emotional process, but there's also important disciplines that can help make the process work a lot better. So Dwayne Legate is the CEO of Commissions, Inc. It's the fastest growing real estate lead generation solution in North America right now. And he's got a, a, a partnership with some of the best brokers and agents and teams in America today. And he's going to give you some really interesting insights about ways to, to operate your business more effectively. And then we've got Ira with us. Ira Monko is from uh, Onboard. And he's got 16 years' experience building software in the real estate industry. So he comes at it from, OK, I, I, you guys tell me what your needs are, and I'm going to build you some stuff that's going to make your life a lot easier and a lot more profitable. So. Great team of people here to talk today. So I'm going to just click over to the next slide, and we're going to get rolling. I'm going to introduce first Lance, who's going to kind of walk us through a few topics, understanding better about the home buyer life cycle. So Lance, take it away. Hey, this is Lance Simpson. Um, so I've been doing real estate for about 10 years, and I can kind of tell you the, the home buyer life cycle um, that buyers kind of go through, they kind of hit four main stages. What you kind of see your home buyers will start with an abstract thought of either moving or kind of figuring out what their home is worth. Then they kind of go in and they, they get a little more serious. Um, we'll start kind of getting into a little more of a dedicated research. And, and so we're kind of finding most of that research nowadays, they're, they're doing it online. Once they determine what they're looking for, what they like, what they don't like, um, all the everything that they want to incorporate, they, they kind of start bringing us in for their help for that process. And once they kind of bring us in for that help, then it kind of goes into choosing the right home, what they can afford, what they can't afford, uh, kind of matching up what's available in the inventory. And you know, kind of once we kind of put that pair together, it'll move us to uh, closer to a closing. So on average, we find that that whole process takes about 10 weeks, according to uh, NAR, on their uh, 2014 uh, home buyers uh, and sellers profile. So what we really care about, though, is kind of more of that research phase, kind of that phase when the home buyer is choosing who they want to work with um, and how they want to kind of go through that process. So this is kind of where we grab the prospect and, and make them choose choose us to, to be their agent and hold on to them for the, uh, the time it takes to convert the sale. Uh, so, so the research phase, this is the phase um, that the lead, finding a lead and keeping them engaged throughout the, the life of the buy cycle is where they're going to kind of go through and discuss today um, throughout the slides. As we learn, making sure the home buyer knows, knows us, trusts us, and stays with us throughout the long haul is a mix of art and science. Um, so hopefully when you leave here today, you're going to kind of come up with about 20 tips to convert more leads as a real estate agent or a broker. Uh, some of these you may already know, um, and hopefully others will are just going to be some good reminders for you. Um, so, you know, as you know, technology advances, and we can achieve results you want without investing a lot of time or money. Um, so I, I'd let's get started. Okay, next slide. 
So, Walt, maybe you can tell us, you know, kind of how this whole focus works between capturing leads, communication, and highlighting your expertise. How, what's the best way to, to take, a, take a client through this sure. process? Sure. So, I mean, a, a few things. <clears throat> uh, obviously, I'm, I'm Walter Brown, and I've, I've been in charge of uh, national sales here at Onboard for about four years. Uh, just a quick intro. Um, and, you know, look, with this event agenda here we have before us today, uh, we're hitting on uh, some of the highlights of, you know, how to engage and convert your customers. And, you know, personally, I deal with long sales cycles all the time and, uh, you know, basically my entire career. And really what keeps people engaged is just the idea of having them believe in you and that really starts with establishing a relationship early on. So the idea of uh, you have to understand their need and in order to capture that lead. Um, and then next you need to be able to uh, communicate effectively with that and with that lead and then foster the relationship. And then the final piece of that would be building trust, uh, you know, throughout kind of the sale process and also afterwards, right? <clears throat> and I would say that there's, there are many different ways to do that, and I can touch on that a little bit, you know, further and a little bit later in the presentation. But um, throughout this presentation, we're going to be basically talking about best practices, um, and you'll hear that from, you know, whether it's Dwayne or Lance or whomever, um, and that, uh, you know, really how to get trust is the single most important thing that will ensure that not only they convert today, but will call you several years down the line, especially for, uh, like, look, any good salesperson knows it's not about the sale today. Um, as, as important as that is, it, it a lot of times comes down to having repeat uh, customers and referral business, especially in the real estate world. Um, so gaining the trust of that client and having them come back to you, uh, you know, six months from now or two years from now is really what it's all about. Yeah, you know, I think this this stuff that you're talking about, well, everybody that's in sales, there's nothing that you would say that people say, oh, I've never heard that before. It really, I think what you're going to learn today are some of the specific ideas. And I guess the word that always comes to mind when I think about the sales process is discipline. So if you've been in sales, and I'm sure many of you on the call have been or are, are at the moment, you know how, how difficult it can be sometimes to do the things you know you're supposed to do every day? And that's really what, the, at the end of the day, it's kind of like exercising, right? We all know we should exercise every day. We don't always all do that every day. So these guys are going to give you some really good, good tips, some specific things to do. But also, as you're going through this, think about the fact of how disciplined are you really? Do you do this every day? And when you do it consistently, do you see a difference in your business? I know I certainly do, and I bet many of you do as well. So let's click over to the next slide. We're going to ask you a quick poll question to get, get us kicked off, and then we'll jump into it. Okay, so this, this is really just kind of getting us all to better understand. You know, when you think about all the leads that you get in your business, and I know sometimes it's hard to put your finger on it, um, but when you think about it, what's the best, you know, the best source of referrals that you see today? Well, of those things on the list, referrals, my website, open houses, third-party sites, et cetera, et cetera. Just give us a quick hit on that, on the one that you think is the best for your business currently. And then we'll jump back into the presentation in just a second. I'll go. This is Lance. Um, I'm going to okay. tell you probably some of our best leads that, that we get and, and we work the majority of our, are the leads that come directly from our website. Cool. Well, that's great. I'm, that's, we want to hear more about those because we haven't seen the results yet. But um, let's, let's jump into the presentation. So we've got um, Ira that's going to give us a bunch of really, I think, some really exciting tips and little tricks and things that are, are going to make the work that you do just much more effective without having to spend a whole lot time, more time on it yourself. So, Ira, maybe if you could just take us through all these exciting tips you've built for us, that would be terrific. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ira Monko. I'm a uh, implementation and sales engineer here at Onboard Informatics. Um, I've, I've been doing uh, software development in the real estate space for about 16 years. So, um, I just want to give you guys, uh, you know, a few. Um, uh, tips on design and, and how to encourage to develop some more leads from your website. Uh, Great. So, you know, when you're um, when you're thinking about the flow of your website, uh, you really want to put yourself in the in the consumer's shoes and uh, think of what's in it for me. And so, you know, uh, on the real estate websites, we you know we all have uh, uh, listing searches, uh, and that encourages people to start uh, actively participating. Um, so you want to have functionality on there that also um, helps out the consumers. And you know, one of those that we have is uh, save searches. Uh, and that's a great uh, incentive piece um, for them to start uh, 
um, submitting their information um, because this is something that they uh, derive value out of. Um, and once you have that uh, information, uh, you can also provide other uh, valuable services and, and content to them, such as community reports, uh, recent home sales transactions uh, in their area, uh, sales trends over time, um, and uh, you know these these can also be built into uh, tools like drip marketing systems. Um, and these are all things that, that the consumers are looking for and are uh, actively willing um, to give you their information. Um, so it's a uh, it's a, a an even trade. Um, you want to go to the next slide for me, please? Great. Um, so when you're actually building out the lead form, um, you know there's a, there's a trade-off um, when you're when you're designing it and you're thinking about the number of fields that you put on there. Um, typically, we notice that uh, the less fields you have, the higher conversion rate on that lead form. However, um, uh, the more fields you have, you can also uh, gather more information and um, and make sure that the the lead is isn't it will be more qualified with more information that you have. Um, so there's a, a little bit of a trade-off there, and you have to figure out uh, what the sweet spot is. Um, next slide, please. One of the other things to consider when you're uh, in your design is you want to get the form somewhere where the consumers are going to actually see it. Um, so if you can, and, and you'll see in this example, uh, if you can get it up there uh, above the fold, uh, that's certainly the best, and we've seen higher conversions when that happens. Next slide. Now this next uh, example that we have here is actually in the verbiage of um, buttons um, or the mechanism that the consumer would use to submit the information. Um, we found that actually using the word submit um, is something that a lot of consumers um, don't, um, uh, it, it feels more committal and uh, it, it implies a, uh, a higher level of an investment and time and effort. Um, so what we what you see here is a conversion rate based on um, buttons that had the word submit and those without. Um, so we make suggestions to use um, words like click here or go, send, register. Uh, any of those will would certainly work better than submit. All right, you know that that's next. consistent with some things that we we hear a lot from consumers about broker websites and agent websites in general, that they feel like if they if they do submit something, that somebody's going to try to sell them Im immediately, and they tell us that's sometimes why they go to third party sites or why they go to MLS sites or places that they think an agent or a broker is not watching as closely. Are there any other tips along those lines that will help a, a, a consumer get more comfortable that just say? We are just want you know this is purely for you. We want you to help help you to you know look around and get comfortable with what's going on in the market and any other kinds of things you've seen with that along the ways or is this one of the biggest biggest differences? This is you know uh, n none of these tips are, are going to be a silver bullet. You know these are mm -hmm. these are all mm -hmm. things that you want to build into a, a strategy and they layer on top of each other. Um, and so I, I have a few more examples um, if we want to keep rolling to the next sure. slide. Um, sure. So, uh, you know, in this example, you want to uh, provide very clear instructions on what your call to action is um, and what you uh, would like the consumer to do. Um, we also, you know, what we're talking about here in this example is speaking to the inner voice of that consumer and, and using uh, words like my instead of your. Uh, we noticed, uh, you know, in this study, a 90% increase in the click-through rate uh, wow. of this treatment. Uh, the That's next amazing. slide. And then, when you're in, in the um, in the realm of design, um, there is uh, the, the principles of conversion-centered design, um, and, and I'm going to uh, speak about a few of those. Uh, when you're developing a lead form, you can use encapsulation, uh, as we see in this case. And then, uh, if you would, go to the next slide. Uh, you can also use color contrast, which will uh, draw the consumer's eye um, uh, where you want to see it, your call to action of, of that web page. Next slide. Um, I think we might have skipped this slide. Can you go back one? Right. Okay. And in this example, um, you can use design elements such as directional cues. Um, to really help uh, navigator navigate a 
uh, users' eyes throughout the web page um, and get them um, to once again go right to that call to action. In this case, it would, it would be your lead form on that page. And if we can go to the, to the final slide here uh, for me, um, and we certainly suggest that, that uh, when you're doing uh, uh, introducing new design, um, if you can, uh, do some A-B testing. Um, this way, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, you take a scientific approach and you understand exactly um, what's going on, what works, and what doesn't work. Um, and in this case, you'll see that um, the, uh, uh, the verbiage underneath the, the terms and conditions, which uh, encourages the, the end user, educates the end user that you're not going to um, be using their information um, to send them unsolicited emails or, or sell them, sell their information to anyone else, notice a, um, almost a 20% increase in signups. Um, Ira, can you explain a little bit what A-B testing is for those that might not know that, those, that verbiage? It's really important stuff when you're doing outbound marketing and website marketing. Certainly. So A-B testing um, is essentially um, having a, a control and your new um, design. Um, in this way, uh, if you have historical information on uh, what the conversion rate was on the control, when you introduce the new design, you can compare the two over a, a period of time and uh, have a very clear picture of what is working and what isn't working. If you're noticing more conversion rates uh, with the new treatment, um, then you certainly want to, to migrate to that one. Um, if you're noticing a, a lower conversion rate, uh, then you know that that treatment didn't work and you need to change something up. Um, and this is, you know, this is a, a very good strategy um, uh, for your website, whether it's uh, conversions or uh, uh, time on page, um, whatever it is. Um, so. And then A-B testing, just for the audience to say, can, can be used in a lot of different environments. So let's say you may do a, you know, some sort of an outbound email newsletter or things like that. You can test all different types of things. You can test just the, um, the headline that you actually put into the email address to see which one gets the better click-through rate. You can check, test different order of, of articles to see if things get different. You get, really, with anything that you do, if you have the time and energy and really the focus on this, it always makes sense to try to test different offers um, before you spend all your money just pushing on one. So it's just it's a, it's a really good marketing discipline to think about in all of the kinds of different programs that you push out to clients and potential clients. Hey, okay, Mayor, let's go. Is, uh, hey, Marilyn, this is Dwayne Legate. Can I jump in for one quick second? You sure can. Please. Um, mm -hmm. a, a very good friend of mine. Uh, used to run all of the consumer marketing for CareerBuilder.com, a top 50 website in the world. I'm sure you guys have seen uh, the job site CareerBuilder.com. And back in the day when Facebook really first started going, uh, they allowed their users to log in with Facebook, and they thought it was going to be a major coup that it was really easy to log into Facebook. But the remarkable thing was their click-through rate and therefore their sign-up rate went down. They started going out and asking people, just asking their friends and neighbors and everything, what do you think about this page? Because they were perplexed as to why. What they found was that people were worried that if they logged in through Facebook, that CareerBuilder was going to post something on Facebook that, hey, Marilyn Wilson is looking for a job on CareerBuilder. So they had the simple verbiage that you could log in with Facebook, but we promise not to post anything at all on Facebook the conversion rates went through the roof. The point being what Marilyn said a minute ago about A-B testing is correct, and you don't need really a massive audience size. Ask your friends, your neighbors, here's my website, take a look at it. What do you think in an unbiased you know, opinion? Because little things make a dramatic difference, even that, uh, though you don't think that it does. I'm sorry to jump in, but that was important No, that's, it's, that's a really important point, and, and I think there's some analogies between career builder, not, not of course, Certainly people don't want their boss to know they're looking for a job, so that's got a, a very high sensitivity rate. But there's a lot of sensitivities with consumers as well, that they believe, again, somehow that if a broker puts something on their website or an agent does, that that means that they're capturing personal information that they're going to use for some other purpose. And they are very sensitive about that. So the more that you can say, hey, we're just going to give you what you're asking for and no more, not in those words obviously, but in, in your own way, it makes a big difference, and um, you know, just marketing is it is an art and a science, and it's a very difficult. It's never finished. It's never done. It's never as good as it can be. 
it's something that you need to pay attention to quite a bit to, to continue to make everything you do better. So let's let's jump over to uh, Dwayne now. Thanks for uh, for jumping in there, Dwayne, with that great uh, suggestion. He's got some really good ideas for us as well, particularly about lead bro profiling and better better understanding, you know, kind of what's important to the person that you're talking to to be able to engage them more effectively. So Dwayne, take it away. Sure. So you think about it. So we're real estate agents, and I say we because I also own a real estate company, uh, a brokerage, as well as uh, Commissions Inc. So we're real estate agents. Um, if you have a name and address and a phone number, that only tells you so much. You've got a general idea about the gender, but but really nothing else. But this is where things like social media can be your friend. For example, at Commissions Inc., we'll actually, let's say that Marilyn Wilson comes in as a lead, we will go out and take a look on all the different social media sites, and we will develop a profile. Think about it this way. If you knew for a fact that Mar Marilyn Wilson was married and had maybe two young children and maybe a dog and a cat, there's a good chance that Marilyn is going to want to move into a good elementary school district, possibly with a fenced-in yard to take care of her, you know, the cat and the dog and the kids and everything else in a, maybe a swim tennis community where her kids can play. So right now we have a name and an email address and a phone number, again, typically that comes through the Internet. The more that you can expand upon what you know, the better off. When we first rolled out social media profiling uh, in Commissions Inc., the very first day a gentleman from Seattle had gotten a lead, found out that that person had a social media profile attached to the lead, check the social media profile, and of all things, they had a mutual friend being his sister. Mm -hmm. He was able to call and say, hey, you're good friends with my sister. Oh, by the way, this is, you know, whoever it was. It might have been Paul Cantu, um, and I'm a real estate agent. And it was a very easy introduction because now it's not a cold call. It's a warm transfer. So the more that you can really figure out who you're talking to, what their motivations are, the more bullets that you've got in your gun, the better chance that you're going to have to be able to build rapport, to build a relationship, and therefore be the real estate agent of choice. Um, next slide, please. Let's get, just to build on that a little bit, Dwayne. So okay. that's the kind of thing you would normally do if you met somebody, right? You would do the who do you know and what do you do and all of that stuff. What you're saying is now from an online perspective, you can, you can shortcut that process and do the same kind of thing. So if, if somebody's on LinkedIn with you, for example, you found out that you both love to do archery or who knows, crazy things like that, all of those are the kinds of things you normally do to find common ground when you're talking to somebody. Now you can do it online as well. In a very short amount of time, too. It really takes, you know, what, 15 seconds. We do it in an automated fashion. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a way to do it in an automated fashion, it still takes you 15 to 30 seconds to maybe scan three or four of the top social media sites to see if you can find that person. So it's actually, you know, it's absolutely well worth it to, to garner that little piece of information that could make a tremendous difference between getting the relationship and not. Just like you yeah. said, the, the area of commonality is, is really critical. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, I've tried that myself. It, it can take you up to 30 or 40 minutes to do that online. Um, if you if someone like me with the name Marilyn Wilson, there's 400 pages of Facebook pages with Marilyn Wilson. Which one is it, and which one is she really involved with? And does she have children, or is she retired, or is she an artist, or is she a lawyer? You know, all of the different things you find out. It can take a long time. So to automate that, boy, does that take time. That's awesome. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I think we're going to have Beverly help us a little bit with this one. Beverly, can you help us understand? You know, I talked a little bit about this up front, about the fact that without cell systems, we all kind of fall apart with what we do here. Can you tell us, talk us a little bit about your perspective on that? Absolutely. As agents, we, we like that quick rush of the new lead coming in, and we've quickly realized that the gold is really in the follow-up. As the new leads are coming in, it's very easy to make that first initial phone call because we actually have a system within our um, website that calls us when that new lead comes in. So when we answer the phone, it asks us if we're available, and then we simply press 1, and it will then call that lead immediately. 
So the very first contact is, is the easiest and the most simple. But then okay. having systems in place in order to follow up properly, because if you don't get a hold of them that first time, it's important to have a call sequence within that 24 hours to get a hold of them, because the more time goes by, they're not just logging into your website specifically, they're logging into several. So you want to capture them as quickly as possible. If you yeah. do not capture them within a call sequence in those first 24 hours, we keep them in a what we call a filter for 30 days, and we activate that filter with our dialer. So on, on a given time, and we usually have about 30 people in there. They're just rotating out because as we're getting a hold of them, we set a follow-up date, and we know when we need to be following up with them. And the follow-up date, that, that's really what the key is and kind of tying into what Dwayne said, going in on that social media and being able to, when you do follow up with them, sprinkle in something because we can actually go back and look at homes that they have viewed and if you find a home that they viewed 10 times, you're able to then maybe tie that into something that you found through their social media to be able to make that connection and, and attempt to build that camaraderie. So can you tell us an example of that? Like, it, Where has that worked for you? And I, I guess the, the flip side of it is, um, I'm sure some people on the call might have this concern. Does, does anybody get a little freaked out that you know so much about them? <laughs> or is it, do they appreciate the fact that you've done your homework? How does that work? Well, it's kind of crazy because you do think that. You're like, wow, they don't realize how much you can actually watch their activity through the websites. But I've never had anybody make a comment that they were kind of freaked out. It was, wow, yeah, that home does meet my needs. Gotcha. I, I don't think they think a lot. We overthink things as agents because we're just afraid to, to step out of that box. Gotcha. So they just appreciate the fact that you followed up with them and that you're, you're paying attention to what their needs are. And it's going above and beyond. And again, like I said, you have to remember that the first agent that connects with that lead is the one that's going to win because buyers are lazy. They don't want to have to go out and work for anything. So if you make connection with them at that right time, you've won. Absolutely. And, and there's study after study after study, not just in real estate, but in many industries that will say that. The first of the party is the one that's got a much, much, much higher chance. So, you know, you see some studies sometimes from NAR where average response time from an agent is like 17 hours. That is just not cutting it anymore, is it? Like, how, how quickly are you calling? If somebody comes in a lead, how quickly are it's you immediate getting that because first if call? If phone call calls us, it's immediate. Immediate, and, right. Yeah. It has to gotcha. be the first five minutes, and that, that's why it's so key to, to try and catch them in that first 24 hours. Um, it, it's just, I was part of another lead gen. I, I've been doing lead gen since 2009, mm -hmm. and it was funny. The, the one lead that I used to get, it would actually go out to three different agents. It would go out to the listing agent, and then, then it would come into my site. I don't even know. It, it was somebody that would pay for a lead, it would go to them. But we won all the time because the listing agents never paid for extra lead generation. They didn't understand. They, they didn't know what to do with the lead when the lead came in. So let me ask a reality question, too, because I hear this a lot from agents. So the fact that you're calling them back is awesome, and, and if, that is, I'm sure, helping to grow your business. But what happens when that call comes in when you're in an appointment or you're on a, you know, you're on a showing call or you're doing something else with another client? How do you handle that? You have to have leverage. You have to have someone that's going to be handling calls outside of yourself. And that's where the ebb and flow in your business comes from. Mm -hmm. If you have, A, someone that's making the phone calls and they're not that great on the phone at building that rapport and setting that appointment, your business is going to suffer. And if you don't have the coverage to be able to make those phone calls when they need to be made, your business suffers. So uh, an example, like if I'm an independent agent, I'm going to say I'm not on a team. Do you, do you have like two agents that might, you know, back up each other? Or how, do, how do you do that? Everybody runs their businesses differently. Um, usually a single agent will just let the lead go, and they'll call them whenever they can get to them. Okay. Gotcha. Which, i.e., ends up you have just a lower conversion rate because you're right. not getting a hold of them immediately and making that connection. Gotcha. And do you think brokers should think about 
providing support for independent agents like that that are you know that aren't a part of a team when when they know that they're on appointment, is there someone they should back it up to, or what you're thinking about that? Because, of course, a lot of people are working independently these days. Yeah, and everybody's so different. It all depends on where they want their business to go and mm -hmm. how much ROI they want to get from their system. Gotcha. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. Let me just quickly recap what we've heard so far, and then we'll go to the next one. So there's, a, I think, you know, lots of good ideas here that we've heard so far. The first one is, you know, thinking about you as, your, as an individual person, how am I going to provide value? And how am I going to have make sure that my website provides value without it being too, you know, trying to grab somebody too too quickly because agents or consumers will bristle against that. Asking for only what you need on the lead capture form is really important. You know, you, you want some information, but not so much that it makes people say, oh, this is too much. They're asking for too much information. And keeping your form above the fold, or basically when I open up a website, that first page that I see, making sure that it's right there. Great advice about the word submit. That you know, you wouldn't think that would make a big difference um, using submit versus you know go or some of the other words that we talked about, but it certainly does. So something to think about. And providing clear instructions on whatever form that you're on, and sometimes on search too. I've seen some sites where it's kind of difficult to figure out what to do with that. And then applying the principles of conversion-centered design that we saw in the, in the directional, you know, guiding someone with big arrows to tell them where to go next, things like that. Making it as simple and as you know easy for people to get through as possible. And then the concept of doing A-B testing, trying, you know, trying a couple of different things. See which one works better for you and, and continue to do that. Your website is a dynamic living concept and it has to continue to change and evolve. So it's, something, it's, not, it's not a set it for, and forget it. You have to keep working on it. And then as uh, Dwayne talked about, using technology to learn more about your prospect. There's a lot of different places out there today that we can learn more about potential customers and we have to tap into that. And you know, systems that have it is even better. And then, as we just talked about with Beverly, having a system that helps you follow up and helps you be that first person to answer the phone. It's absolutely critical. OK, let's go to the next one. And by the way, along the way, if any of you guys have questions that you'd like to ask the panel um, at the end of this, feel free to go over into um, where it says type message here type and, and ask us a question. We'd love to hear from you. OK, I'm going to jump into the next section now. And we're going to have a, we're going to hear from uh, Beverly again on um, what goes on with these. You know, how do you cater your message to your prospect? How do you make it make sense for them? It's it's just asking the right questions and remembering that when people are coming into our website, they really want two things: they want to see a house and they want a good deal. So once we identify exactly what they're looking for, asking those right questions, and our main objective is to get the appointment. I, I used to spend a lot of time doing the entire interview on the phone, just mm -hmm. getting them, building the rapport, and it, I, I would I would be on the phone for a good half hour, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't real effective in calling mass quantities of people, but just going in for that appointment and explaining to them coming in to see a prop, coming into the office and. Mm -hmm allowing them to go see a property, giving them what they want is, is where we found that that connection is best made. And it really doesn't matter what the personality is of the person. What really matters is understanding how that lead got to you, why they came into the website, what were they looking for, what made them click on this area in particular. So the more we understand about what their needs are, the more we're able to go and help them get what they're looking for. Gotcha. Walt, did you want to jump in on this one too, the, talking about personality types and how that might help, um, how you might adjust your language based on, on what you know about them? Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, as was mentioned earlier uh, by Dwayne, you know, learning a lot about the people that you're dealing with um, makes sense, and especially with the whole social, social media aspect of it, that's great. You're able to do that more nowadays. Um, so, you know, do they have you know, a cat or a dog or two kids or something like that? You can certainly adjust based on uh, those types of things. The kind of other side to that uh, is, you know, what's the what are the what kind of personality are you are you dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the slide we'll have it's a steak versus sizzle, right? Uh, I kind of like to when I'm uh, working with people, I like to kind of slice it into those at least two different categories, and there can be more, um, but that really helps me simplify uh, personally, and you know. There can be something like a person who is a sizzle person, maybe more of, a, for example, my CEO, uh, kind of a high passion, high energy, uh, wants a 10,000 foot, you know, 30,000 foot view, 
And so you sell to that person in a different way. Um, you kind of pitch them on a grandiose vision, or maybe mm -hmm. if you're selling a house, you tell them how great it could be, and that you know, think about the parties you could have in the backyard and things like that. Whereas um, you know, we're talking more of a person who's uh, meat and potatoes or like the steak. I like to say would be somebody like my chief information officer, who's a you know a pure data person and mm -hmm. wants to make decisions just based off of data and analytics. And so, okay, well, what's the home you know, what's the home worth? And well, I won't pay a dime more or whatever it is, right? So, um, you know, selling and convincing that person is a whole different process. And mm -hmm. so, I think it's very important to identify that early on. Which type of person are you dealing with? And, and again, there's, there's, there must be a spectrum where mm -hmm. some people are somewhere in between and some are you know, very high sizzle and some are more uh, on the low end of the stake. Um, you know, and again, I think it comes down to once you identify that, then you have to connect with them, right? So I, I play hockey and I tell people that a lot of the times. And you never know, sometimes people say, hey, hey me too. And so that, that's all part of it, right? So identifying mm -hmm. and connecting, don't, don't be afraid to uh, open up to people. I always say that that's, that's kind of a huge part of this whole thing. And then I think a third piece of, you know, say why, just always remember to do, explain to people why you do what you do. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, again, it differs for everybody, but everybody has a reason why they are in the business, especially, you know, getting into real estate and becoming an agent. Um, there's, there's typically a reason you got into it, uh, whether you wanted to, you know, work for yourself and, or help people achieve the American dream, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Just remember to tell people why you do it. So a lot of times that helps them uh, to circle back. And number one, it helps them identify with you um, ultimately. So uh, again, I, I said a lot, but I, you know, I think there's probably there's maybe some questions that come out of that. But. Okay, great. Well, let's go to the next slide because Dwayne's got some thoughts about this too. And they, they actually have a system they call the DISC profile that helps cater your message to your prospect. Can you tell us more about that, Dwayne? Sure. So. Um, DISC uh, profile is used a lot in real estate um, for hiring internally uh, to, to figure out you know who's really good to be an administrative person or who would be good to be a, a telemarketer or an outside sales associate. We've actually taken that philosophy and mm -hmm. automated it, and now we actually DISC profile our buyers as they're coming in to the website. For example. Wow. Um, there's a D and I and S is a C. The D stands for dominant. It's a guy like me, right? So <laughs> when I go shopping, well, it, it, I'm not saying I'm dominant, but that's that's what I fall up under. So when okay. I go shopping and maybe I need uh, some fall clothes, I walk into Macy's. I know my size. I grab the first four pair of blue jeans that I see. I grab six things off the rack. I like it, like it, like it. I don't even try it on. I'm out of there in probably 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. I don't size fit. I don't comparison shop. I'm in. I'm out. I'm gone. I see a deal. I grab it. I leave. Mm -hmm. A C, a C. Think about like a, a software programmer engineer. Mm -hmm. These people are very methodical, and they will check from one thing to the another, and they will look at all the different store flyers. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a great example. The last time I bought a car. Acura uh, 2008, and I had a good idea what I wanted to be fair, but from the time I got to the lot to the time that we were signing the papers was 15 minutes. The car dealer guy said it was an all-time record. I kind of said, this is what I want, this is what I'm paying, if you can't do it, I'm, I'm good with that, I'm walking out, we were signing papers. Matt Swanson, who's our chief software architect here locally um, at Commissions Inc., he had all these charts and spreadsheets and graphs and historical, you know, and crash tests. It took him a year and a half of research to buy a car. Right. I was 15 minutes. He was a year and a half. So he, he's more of the C. And S, think about an S as being um, a protective mother. So everything, when you're talking to an S, everything's about the children. So mm -hmm. this is a great home, three-bedroom, two-bath, in a very good school district that will give your children an education. It, it, it's all about the children. The I is the influencer, gotcha. right? So the, gotcha. they're the people that want the the, the – the nice deck in the back because they're going to entertain and have fun. Mm -hmm. So the great thing about it is, is as these leads come in, we set up automatic drips based on what they want. The C's will get detailed charts, graphs, information, historical price, you know, everything you could possibly, uh, a C could possibly want. And over the course of time, they become engaged with you, the real estate agent, because again, we're sending them what they want on their behalf. 
Perfect. It's just been highly effective. So, well, to put it this way, Marilyn, we have got a better than a 50% open rate and a 25% action rate on these disk type emails because we've wow. really got it dialed in. So a really good performance rate for open rates for a perspective is 10 to 15. 20 is awesome, and 50 is like off the charts, like it's really good. All right, let's move on to the next slide on to, um, I think we're going to ask Beverly about this one, if you could go to tip 11. Okay, Beverly, tell us about setting expectations. And have you ever had a client that you, you sort of started with and you didn't do this right and you set off on the wrong foot and it didn't work so well? Tell us about that. Absolutely, and wow how we learn from our experiences, right? You know, when setting expectations is so incredibly important throughout the whole transaction because if, if it's not there, there's always so much margin of, for error because it comes down to communication then. So when you start off the transaction with, on the wrong foot, so let's just say, for example, you have a very strong personality and they know it all and they're going to tell you how the business is going to work. It's, it's hard for me to give them my expertise and work in their best interest when they're trying to dictate back to me. Mm -hmm. So in that event, it, it's just going back to them and just saying, hey, listen, we're all in this to get to the, to the end result here, and that's to get you in a home or to get your home sold. Let's just reevaluate on how we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And if they have a really hard time connecting with that type of conversation, mm -hmm. I've learned it's just really not worth moving forward with that particular client because gotcha. Gotcha. the way our team is structured, mm -hmm. we have multiple people working with that client and I might be able to handle any type of personality, but I can get through it. But then whenever it goes to the processor and she has to process the file, that's usually where things end up getting a little murky. Mm. And then it just makes her job miserable and it just disrupts everything in the entire office. Gotcha. So sometimes you, you you know that's just not the right client for you, and better to to know that up front than to go through a miserable process and end up with a bad rating or something else. Gotcha. Absolutely. And and where those mistakes are made is when you don't have a lot of business, and you will take anything and everything just to get a deal done. And I will tell you, those deals are going to be the worst deals that you'll ever work because gotcha. if, if you're coming from that scarcity mindset, you're you're just in a certain energy level and. Mm -hmm. You just, yeah, it, it just gotcha. it's bad juju. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. Lance, tell us about um, knowing what questions to ask on that first phone call, that really important first phone call. So, yeah, so, you know, it's probably one of the one of the biggest areas early on um, when I started off that we struggled with because, you know, we'd get people that would, that would you know, we'd, we'd call them, and, and the first thing we always want to do is be like, hey, how are you? And, mm -hmm. I mean, just immediately we would get shut down. It was like, my God, what can we do to get better? And, I, you know, I'm going to kind of go back to, you know, Dwayne, Dwayne was talking about a car story. And I, I've got kind of a similar story where I was like, you know, I'm looking for a car. What, what is it that I want? And I couldn't really visualize what it was. I just knew I wanted something. And, and the guy just started asking me little minute questions, and, and it, a, a bell went off. So we kind, of, we kind of redid our scripts. And I think that was probably my second biggest thing is, never really had anything wrote out to say this is how to make phone calls with people. So we, we mm -hmm. kind of just kind of threw some stuff down on the paper and said, you know, wh what are we really ultimately trying to go after here? And yep. it, it said really set an appointment with the person. Mm -hmm. get, them, get them face to face with us. And, mm -hmm. and the way to do that is to find out exactly what they're looking for. So, sense, you know, yeah. so, so, okay. so, so I said, so, you know, we get a lot of our businesses is from online lead generation and our marketing dollars. So we, we kind of had two opening lines based on what you signed up. If you came in on that $20 million property, mm -hmm. not to say it doesn't happen, but that's not where we spend a lot of our marketing dollars, you know, we'll, we'll kind of open it up with more of a, hey, you know, thank you for signing up on our website. Hey, I just wanted a little clarity as to what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. and, gotcha. and, and get them okay. to talk to us. Yep. Um, and and if the, uh, the biggest objection, well, I'm just looking. Hey, you know what, that's awesome. Um, tying back into the profiles that, that we have, the social profiles, to be able to go in and, and say, hey, you know what, we know they have kids, we know they have that. We can break them down into minute questions and say, hey, you know what, that's awesome. What does that ideal house look like? You know, do you need a three-bedroom or a four-bedroom? Right. Okay. Do you need two-car garage, three-car garage? 
and, and then we just kind of carry on with that. Um, you know, if they did sign up on a property that's specific to our market, you know, we, we just go right in, hey, I noticed you signed up on the website looking for a three-bedroom, two-bathroom home in, in, in this town. Is that correct? And, you know, and it, yeah, that is, you know. Hey, great, if okay. I can find that for you, would you like to see it? So let's go and, to the next one, and let's start building on that. And let's go to slide yeah. 13, or tip 13. How do you overcome objections when they, they say, I don't have enough time, or they don't want to meet with you, or whatever? How do you get, how do you get them through that? You know, that the, the time... Um, just look in and the time are probably the two biggest ones that we get. Um, the time one is, is definitely a, a, a one that we, we, we hear a lot, especially trying to bring them into the office. And, and that's really just tying down to say, hey, you know what, I can appreciate the fact that, that you don't have a, t a lot of time. Let me ask you, you probably want to, to save as much time and as much money on your, your home purchase as possible, correct? And they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, well, well, hey, throughout this process, do you have time to go out and look at 100 homes? Well, well, no, exactly, and that's why if you can give me 20 minutes at my office, we're going to put together a customized plan for you that's not only going to save you time but money on the on the purchase of your new home. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. And, so, and, now let's, and, yeah. yeah and, that and, makes and they sense. do because, you know, otherwise they're just going to go out and spend weekend after weekend after weekend, and they're going to miss the boat. Okay, let's go to the next one because this is one that I think is one of the hardest things as a salesperson to keep keep the discipline on. How do you make sure you make those outbound calls? How do you, how do you keep that going? Um, you know that 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 is, and and I, I'm just as guilty as getting off of that. Um, I, I so I've got one of my agents, and I watch his sales flow go up and down and up and down because he makes phone calls, makes phone calls, and then he gets busy. It's really it's taking a hold of your daily calendar. And, and just saying, you know what, two hours a day. I'm going to dedicate two hours a day, an hour in the morning and an hour at night or wherever we can, and, and we're just going to make phone calls. And, you know, when we've got lists built out into the system, that, that tells us our top priority phone calls that we're going to make. And, gotcha. and it's, just, it's, it's just hitting those phone calls. Um, we, we have accountability in there, so I can go in and see which agents are making the contacts and which ones aren't. So we reward mm -hmm. the ones that are making the phone calls and the ones that don't. But... You know, at the end of the day, what you do today is going to be your paycheck in 60 days. Gotcha. Okay, well, let's go to tip 15. This one we talked a lot about so we can go quick, but tell, tell me about how you can automate all this stuff because some of this, you know, making a phone call, no one can do that for you, but what about technology? How can it help you look like you're doing a lot more than you really are <laughs> with your customers? Dwayne, you want to jump out on that one? Dwayne? I accidentally had you on mute. I apologize because you guys oh, no have to mute one. I'm, I was just a talking away. I apologize. Okay, um, <laughs> it was fascinating. So, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just to let you know, um, if you come to one of our commissions Inc. websites that we build, custom build for our clients, we follow the buyer around like a detective. We, we we build a profile and we find out that Marilyn Wilson is looking in Marietta, Georgia, for a three bedroom, two bath brick house. Um, and everything that happens within that sphere that's similar, we start to send Marilyn Wilson on a daily, every other day uh, basis new updates. And maybe a property that you currently looked at, uh, maybe they have a price reduction. You're notified. So we do all these things on behalf of the agent so that way the agents can do what they do best, which is to sell homes. Um, other than that, I, I thought that uh, the other gentleman earlier about uh, when he was talking about doing A-B testing on subject lines, if you don't have that level, level of automation, um, make sure that you're really looking at what you do and testing what you do. Every subject line should be slightly different. And then once you get your open rates up, you need to start measuring your action rates within the email. Did someone click on that email and did they come back to you? So you can have a great subject line and horrible body content. The last thing I'll tell you about email marketing is everybody wants to write a book. Write a paragraph. At most, bullet points are easy. Think about how yep. you like to read and how you like to engage. Yep. Okay. Let's look at six, uh, tip 16 about having the coverage and Beverly we talked a little bit about this earlier but what's the best way to make sure that all of these systems don't fall down if you know if you're busy with a client or doing something else it's just really having a plan and knowing how you want your business to function mm -hmm. and if, if you know your goals of the amount of units that that you want to convert how are you going to make it happen 
and do you gotcha. need to have that staff help to make that happen, and then who is that person? Okay. Uh, Dwayne, I want you to tell everybody about tip 17 about using the right tools and whether or not it's Dwayne friendly or not. This is funny. <laughs> Yeah, we have a very easy rule within Commissions, Inc. Um, I do own a technology company, but I'm a technology idiot. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, so basically, we have a rule. When our programmers and developers make something, they kind of come to us or come to me and say, Dwayne, can you use that? I've got to be able to push a button and things happen. If I can push a button and know that things happen, we know that all other users can too. So as you're developing tools, for your clients. It doesn't matter what types of tools, whether it's email or, or ways to contact you. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself, is it Dwayne friendly? Yes, you may able to be able to use it, but what about a 63-year-old person who's not as familiar with technology as you are? So make it simple, keep it simple, and your conversions will actually go up. And I, will, I would add one thing to that. When you're choosing a solution you're going to use, and the word CRM is kind of a buzzword, but a lot of people don't know what that means. It means client relationship management. When you're choosing your own, make sure you test it really well because some are great, but they're so darn complicated that you won't be able to use it as an agent or a broker. So check your math on that. That's, that's a place I see a lot of companies get in trouble, and then they, they don't use them and they fall apart. So, Okay, next one, 18, Lance, being accessible. Tell us about that real quick. Um, I, you know, I'm going to tell you probably one of the things I love the most about my website is the mobile app. And it is my entire dashboard that's available right on my cell phone. I've got an okay. auto dialer. I can do mass messages, mass texting, set appointments, put notes in there. If I'm not available, I can assign the task to one of my agents. So there is nothing that's missed. So if I'm, if I'm out on the road, I'm traveling around, everything is right there on my cell phone. So no excuses anymore. You got it with you. You no. got to keep going on it. Okay. Absolutely. How about Lance? Tell us about don't being not being afraid to lose. This is a hard one sometimes too. You know it, it is. So probably one of the biggest things I see whenever I bring on new agents, they're they're afraid of of losing a sale, and they're going to do anything and everything they can to try to keep that client. Um, that might even go against the core values of of our team. And and you know at the end of the day, I always tell them, you know, you can't lose something you never had. So, you know, you, you've got to be able to give them the value and, you know, and oftentimes, you know, I mean, it, it is kind of being that consultative role and telling them some of the things that they don't want to hear, but, you know, they're going to they're gonna respect you more for it at the end of the day. And if you did lose that client, well, you know, again, you, you never had them to begin with. So, you know, well, you Beverly move on to the next one. Ms. Beverly said Sometimes you don't want the client because it's not a good match and that's going to be a problem for all of you. So, okay, let's exactly. skip the recap because we're running a little short on time. And let's just try, jump right over to tip, tip 20. And uh, Ira's going to talk to us a little bit about establishing trust. Sure, yeah. You, you know, when you're trying to, uh, when you want to convince consumers online uh, to get in touch with you and do business with you, you want to be able to uh, establish trust. So here, here are just a couple simple examples of ways that you can do that. You know, the, the first is post testimonials on your website. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. Um, the next, uh, uh, showcase any industry awards that, that you might have won. Um, mm -hmm. You know, those certainly help. Uh, they come from a third party. Uh, and then finally, uh, the next slide, uh, any media mentions uh, that, you, that you might have um, are also a, a great idea. And then finally, uh, if we go to the next slide, the last tip is you can leverage third-party um, sites that uh, your consumers might already be a part of. Um, this mm -hmm. will make their account registration uh, go quicker, uh, and um, you benefit. Uh, you can leverage um, the, the trust that they have within those. Um, that makes you trustworthy, credible, and, and a knowledgeable resource. Okay, let's go over to 21. Beverly, tell us about your value proposition. How do you explain to someone what makes you different than other real estate agents? Because to new customers, sometimes it's kind of a sea of agents. They don't know the difference. You are absolutely right. And the, and the consumers don't understand that there's a difference either. And, you know, it, it, it's having that equal balance of trying to convey it over the phone to get the appointment. But, it, again, it just goes back to asking them the right questions. And really where that comes into play in a big way is whenever they say they already have an agent. And just asking them, are your needs being met? Or do you think you're seeing all the properties that are out there? Because why are they in our website if they're already working with an agent? And when, when you really start to open their eyes to it's not just about 
about us opening the door for them. It's about mm -hmm. all the schematics that go along with the contract and being represented properly. And mm -hmm. I'm a big storyteller, so I just I I always go into a horror story that's happened with another agent where the client left pretty much unrepresented and made a ton of mistakes and the clients need to understand that there's agents out there that are only doing five deals a year and is that what you really want to represent you? Yeah, and it's hard to not, you know, not throw your other agent, fellow agents under the bus, but sometimes they just need to understand that that's not how all agents operate, so it's, yeah. it's important. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we've got about five minutes left. I'm just going to, uh, let's just quickly jump over to the poll results, and we'll show you what, what, how you guys, um, what, what your answers were for um, where you find your leads most often. So not surprising, the referral is going to be, you know, the, the biggest place that it comes from. And I think a lot of what we just talked about today are ways to take up the value of your website and other tools that you use to make them to become even, even a more important lead generation source for you. Of course, referrals are always going to be important, but there's a lot of great ideas that were shared with you today that are going to help you, um, you know, use your website and other things even more effectively. Okay, so okay. with that, I'm going um, to open it up for questions, and I've got a few here. If anybody has any other ones, let me start with the ones we've got. Um, for, so the first one was, I, I run a lead acquisition program for a company with over a 1,000 agents. Do you recommend incubating qualified leads on the corporate side before handling, handing off to an agent, or do you recommend giving agents the responsibility of nurturing qualified leads? That, you know, wait, basically, at what point should you hand it over to an agent? And maybe, Dwayne, if you, maybe you want to take that one, and then I'll jump over to Beverly for that. No? It's Beverly? Not, the mute button isn't Beverly? Dwayne friendly. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of information. I was actually looking to see if I could see it in the chat. Could you rephrase that question for me, please? Yeah, basically the question is, if, if I'm running a group, a lead acquisition program for my company, this person has a 1,000 agents, so it's a big firm, mm -hmm. do you believe that the company itself should incubate the light leads and then pass them to an agent, or should they just pass the lead to the agent and let them figure out if it's a good one or not. Where, where's wow. that line? What's Great the company's question. role versus the agent? Um, well, where, where that line is, is in the training. Who is the person that is going to be most likely to convert? And what does that training look like? Because we've realized in when Dwayne was talking about the different personalities, that the disc, your personality comes through when you're the one that's on the making the phone calls. And the, the higher I you are, the more talky you are, the higher D you are, you, you can handle rejection. And you really need a person that can handle that rejection or they're just going to get burnt out. So exactly. it, it really comes down to, again, your business plan and, and how you want to set up. You know, we have organizational charts on our team and we have boxes that need to be filled. Who's in that box? Who makes those phone calls? And you've got to have the person that's going to be able to convert in that box. Gotcha. So it's, so it's not a it's not an either either or answer necessarily. It's, no, it depends because, on your specific situation. Well, like everything. What we realized is usually the person that's really great at sales, they're great out on the road with the clients. But when it comes down to sitting in a confined cubicle, being on the phone, it, it's just personality-wise. You got to match that personnel. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, hey, this is Dwayne. I'm sorry. Actually, the, my mute uh, button was stuck. I, I know how to work <laughs> the mute button. And I was sitting there like banging on the thing. Um, so it, there's this is a good two... example of Dwayne friendly, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there's two things I would say here. Um, one, if you're going to incubate the lead for the clients, I would have a different commission split. Or I'm sorry, for your free agents, I would have a different commission split because you're now taking on a one of the hardest functions of the entire real estate process, which is getting the appointment set. The second thing I will tell you is if you do distribute all of your lead flow uh, out to your agents, don't do it in a socialistic manner. The best agents get the best leads, period. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Don't worry about hurting Fred or Linda's feelings because you're not giving them five leads a month, but you are giving Julie. Well, if Julie's closing four out of five in Fred and Linda, or you know, one out of ten collectively, you need to put the lead flow to Linda. So make sure if you do spread it out, hold them accountable 
for the end result. Gotcha. Okay. Here's another one for you, Dwayne, while you're unmuted. Don't mute. <laughs> we need you. <laughs> okay. Uh, one more question, then we're going to wrap up, I think. Um, how do you discover the disk persona that you talked about earlier? How do, how do you get to that? I mean, it's a great discipline, but how do, where does it go, and how do you do it? When you say, when you, how do you discover it? How do we discover our buyers, or... How yeah, how do you how do you how do you figure out that I'm a D or an I or an S or a C? How do you how do you get to that? Now, other than okay, just so, asking a lot of questions, how do you do it? Yeah, well, uh, basically, um, we did a tremendous amount of testing. So we ask some very simplistic questions in in a radio button format mm -hmm. as you're registering for our site. But okay. then we kind of confirm things. So let me give you an example. Um, one of the questions we asked was, "Would you be interested in a smoking hot home deal?" A D is all day long. A C says, ooh, that sounds like a scam to me. So let's say that the D clicks that. So right now we think you're a D. But mm -hmm. then how you interact with the website. Mm -hmm. Me, I'm pushing buttons as fast as I can to get the information as fast as I can. And again, the other end is the C. They are going to read everything on the page slowly. Okay. So if I'm, you know, there's ways that we can figure it out, and then ways that we confirm it, and that's just you know been through a, a lot, a lot of testing and a lot of luckily brilliant engineers that we have on our side. Gotcha. Okay, let's click to the slide. I want to I want to make sure that everybody on the call gets to see the great offer that you guys are offering. Do you want to talk us through that, Dwayne, the 50% off offer? Sure. So just to let you guys know, we are geared more towards the team type environment, although we have just rolled out uh, a commissions in smaller version for the individual agent. Okay. Um, but both of our platforms are basically built to grow your business in an exponential uh, way. And, and again, mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why we work with literally the top you know, 2% of all real estate agents uh, nationwide. But if you want more information, what we're going to do for all the people that were uh, nice enough to attend today, we are going to offer a 50% off deal for the first month platform fee. And really simple to find out more about it. And if you type in this URL, it does not obligate you to anything, and you don't have to buy. But if you want to take advantage of the offer today and you want more information, go to www.commissionsinc.com forward slash on board, and someone will contact you immediately. Perfect. Okay, next slide, Walt. Let's put your information up there too. If anybody has interest information or, or interest in what Onboard does. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, again, we just want to make sure everyone knows that we're thrilled to be able to you know, partner with with uh, RE Technology and Commissions Inc. on this. And you know, look, we we basically uh, put together partnerships with a place like Commissions Inc. to be able to extend uh, all, all of our uh, hyperlocal content and data into uh, the best agents uh, around the country. So it's a great partnership, and we believe in long-lasting partnerships. And again, we're thrilled to be able to help. Uh, you know, promote in any way and present uh, in this platform. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I hope the folks that attended today got some interesting tips and tidbits about better ways to market their business. And again, if you want to learn more about Commissions, Inc., you've got the contact information. Thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope you sell a bunch of stuff over the next few weeks. Thank you.